This is a special presentation of Farm Journal Television. It's time for your weekly class in corn. I'm Clinton Griffiths and welcome to Corn College TV. Today we're looking at managing beyond the plant with a discussion about pests and how to keep them in check. Corn College TV heads to the field for a quick calculation of projected ear count. And from the satellite to the palm of your hand, take a tour of this handheld GPS on today's Farmer's Toolbox. Today on Corn College TV. Welcome to Corn College TV with field agronomist Ken Ferry, associate field agronomist Missy Bauer, Farm Journal's Margie Fisher, and host Clinton Griffiths. Here at Corn College TV, we talk a lot about getting maximum yields and how to grow great corn. Part of winning during the growing season means doing more than just playing good offense. It means a good defense, too. That's why I recently caught up with Missy Bauer to talk about those pesky little pests that plague farmers every year and how to set up a systems approach for managing them. This is a really important part of the systems approach pyramid is pest management. What all does that entail? It, there's a lot to it. Yeah, I mean, when we say pest management and trying to do that as part of our systems approach, I mean, it can be everything from diseases to weeds to nematodes, some of those other things we've talked about are insects. So it is something large and it, it is important though because all those things can affect yield. Definitely. Uh, there's kind of a, a way that you look at that, and that's in a triangle. Explain that for us. Yeah, that's right. It, it's going to be uh, what we would call the pest triangle. So it's kind of like our disease triangle, but it really encompasses whatever pests that we're dealing with. So again, we've got the three sides of that triangle that we have to deal with. You know, the pests, the host, and those conditions that are going to be favorable. Okay, when you say host, uh, obviously we mean the plant. Yeah, that's right. And what we have to think about with the host is these different genetics and the traits. So when we start thinking about, I'll use insects, for example. When we start to deal with insects, does that corn have corn borer protection in, or, in it or not? Does it have protection against western bean cutworm that we'll show some examples of today? So we have to understand those traits and know what's in it and know which fields have them and which fields don't. Okay. Uh, the other side of that is conditions. A lot depends on what's happening around it. That's right. The conditions, and this becomes really important and will change every year. One thing uh, to use, for example, again with the insects, is they are very heat unit based. So we can't just simply look at the calendar and say, okay, on this date I should start scouting for this insect because they're going to be heat unit based. So this year, in, in 2010, for example, we've been very far ahead on heat units. So a lot of cases we're up to 400 heat units ahead compared to previous years. So all of a sudden all our insects are now shifted forward. So something that maybe we scouted for, you know, the middle of June, now we're scouting for the first of June or something that we had deal with uh, with the western bean cutworm, for example, maybe in later July, now came mid-July. So we got to utilize our weather stations to track these heat units to know when we need to be out in the fields looking for the insects. Because if you don't know, you can miss them. I mean, they, they come that fast or they start that early and That's next right. thing you know you have a mess on your hands. You bet. So the third thing is a pest. What, what's a good example of something we'd be dealing with this time of year? Yeah, well, when we think about pests, uh, for example, we'd maybe use an, an insect again. Um, something new that we've been dealing with more in the eastern corn belt is the western bean cutworm. So this has started affecting us um, starting in July and kind of worked through uh, the tail end of August and now it's starting to go into its overwintering cycle. But it, it's something that's newer, but it can do a lot of damage out, out in the actual field. We have some examples of some ears here, and if we just look at that from the husk, we can see where we've got some holes in here. Right. And if you actually start to peel these back and take a closer look, we can see where we've had some of this damage. Damage. And what oh, wow. happens Look earlier that. is these western bee cutworms are larvae and they're going to come in here and actually feed and then once they leave they're not just done having a problem because as you can see we get all this mold in here. Oh, so right. the first problem is they eat kernels, we have yield loss that way. The second part is now we've got an area for disease. So we started off with an insect problem and now we've got a a disease or a mold problem in our actual ears. So that's something that, that we've got to try to stay on top of, do some scouting. The traits come into this as far as my host because some corn will be resistant to this, other traits are not, so we have to play that into it. 
But how do we know if we're going to have a western bean cutworm uh, problem or not? We use something as uh, simple as a, a milk jug trap, okay? So we have a pheromone in the inside of here, uh, and we'll actually put a little bit of solution of some antifreeze with a little soap in it. We'll hang this out during uh, moth flights, and we'll catch moths in here. And this will give us an idea of how many moths we're catching as well as when this peak flight occurs. So using tools like this, uh, scouting traps and, and trapping for insects is something that can help dial in that timing. It's probably important to make sure that you have somebody that can do all this. That's right, and that's one of the biggest things we see as a problem on the farm is there's nobody in charge of pest management. So what we really try to encourage people to do is pick what we had called the pest boss for the farm, that somebody, whether it's yourself or a hired hand that you've designated to be in charge, but somebody needs to be the pest boss. And what that means is they've got to be available on a timely basis. Right. They've got to have knowledge of what's going on and stay current on new insects, for example, like we we're talking about here. And they've got to have resources and know who to contact. They don't have to know it all, but they've got to know who they can call when they have questions. So having that pest boss is really crucial to the system's approach for pest management. Still to come on Corn College TV, figuring out how harvest might measure up before the ears ever pollinate. We're heading to the field to get an ear count estimate. Plus, Christopher Columbus would be jealous. Global positioning systems in the palm of your hand. We'll tell you how to add it to the farmer's toolbox when Corn College TV continues. Corn College TV is brought to you by DeKalb. For all season strong performance and results you can take to the bin. Go with DeKalb. Gets results with strong roots and strong stocks for performance you can take to the bin. Go with industry leading DeKalb Genetics and proven Genuity Trait Technology, letting you get more from every acre. Go all season strong. Go with DeKalb. Hello, folks. This is Mark Gold with Top Third Ag Marketing. If you need help marketing your grains or livestock, give us a call. We offer one on one relationships that can protect you without the threat of margin costs. We don't speculate, we manage risk. If you're tired of paying acreage and management fees for marketing advice that hasn't actually helped your bottom line, then give us a call. Call today to get two weeks of Mark's private grain marketing email. Top Third Ag Marketing, earning the trust of American farmers every day. America needs to know that something still works in this country. One of those things that is working well is agriculture. And at U.S. Farm Report, what's crucial to me is to make sure we convey the confident, competent voice that I hear from America's farmers and rural residents, that they can count on us. Rural America works. Agriculture works. Watch U.S. Farm Report Saturday morning and Sunday afternoons on RFD-TV. U.S. Farm Report, the spirit of the countryside. Mark your calendar. Ag Connect Expo 2011 is coming to Atlanta, Georgia on January 7th through the 10th. Connect with experts. Learn new ideas, new technology. Connect to the future of agriculture, the newest innovations. Connect globally with producers from around the world. This show sets itself apart from the regional shows. Ag Connect Expo 2011, where the world of agriculture comes together. There's no such thing as a crystal ball in farming. In fact, if you have one, call me, we'll be partners. There are such things as educated guesses, part of managing as you grow. In today's Head to the Field segment, Missy returns with a lesson on projecting ear count ahead of harvest. Today we're out in the field with Farm Journal Associate Field Agronomist Missy Bauer to do a projected ear count. Missy, what exactly should we do and what are the, what's the process? Well, what we want to do uh, kind of mid-season here, or you could apply the same principles that we're doing here real early in the season, is to try to get an idea of what we think the ear count's going to be out here. So what we want to do is measure off a thousandth of an acre. In this case, these are 30-inch row corn, so we're going to stretch the tape out 17 feet, 5 inches. And then we're going to go through and count any plants that we have within that 17 feet, 5 inches first. So we'll go through and do a quick plant count. 33, so we have 33 plants in this thousandths of an acre. That means we have 33 plants, or 33,000 plants per acre. 
So the next thing we want to do is try to estimate out of these 33,000 plants, how many are going to have good harvestable ears. And when we're talking a good harvestable ear, we're talking something that we know we're going to be able to get into the combine, not something that's going to fall through the stripper plates. The way that we do that early in the season without 100% knowing what the ears are going to be up top is going to be by looking at the stalk diameter and the plant spacing. So for the stalk diameters, we start want to look in here and notice the width of the plants in comparison to their neighbors. So right here I have a really good example of a skinnier stalk diameter in comparison to his two neighbors. So in this case here, when we're doing our ear count, I would not count this as a good harvestable ear. When we see the skinny stalk diameter, it gives us an indication that we're behind in maturity and this actually led to a delayed emergence all the way back uh, in the spring when this thing first germinated. But when it's behind like that, with that small stalk diameter, we'll typically have trouble pollinating this ear, or it's gonna end up being a very small ear. Again, nothing that we'd wanna count as our har harvestable ear. The other thing that we try to look and pay attention to is the spacing side of it. For plant spacing, we wanna look and see if we have any what we would call double drops, or two plants that are spaced too close to one another. Here's a real good example here. We have two plants that was a double drop. This happened from the meter itself. So as these uh, seeds were metered in the planter, it was two seeds in the same spot. It come down the seed tube together, and we have what we'd call a true double here. What happens in the situation with a double is that we get too much uh, competition between these two plants and that we don't end up with a good harvestable ear. So we would uh, also count uh, a one less ear out of that double in comparison when we're doing our full ear count in this situation. And Misty, it looks like here that we have a, a skip. What would we do in this case when we're doing our stand counts? Right, when we see these skips out here, in, in this case, um, as we get late in the season, it's hard to determine whether or not this was an actual planter malfunction that we actually didn't drop the seed, or maybe it was uh, poor germination or seed rot or something like that. So it's hard to know late in the season what the cause maybe was, but we definitely know that this is a blank and we're gonna to wanna to pay attention to that. Obviously, we should have had a plant here and hopefully an ear there, so now it's gonna hurt our ear count by having this skip. We definitely see that we have a, quite a few plants that uh, we would not put in our plant count or in our ear count. So here we have one that we're missing here. We're gonna miss another one here. We have one that's behind here. This one as well. We're gonna come in and see we've got a really late one here, and then we're pretty good after that. So we're missing several different ears in this count here, and our actual projected ear count here is only about 27,000, uh, when our plant count's 33,000. So that's one thing that we want growers to look at is what's the difference between my plant count and my ear count, and how close are those numbers to one another? So if I'm in a corn soybean rotation, I would really like to see those numbers within about 1,200 of one another on average. If I'm in a corn on corn situation, I'm dealing with a lot more residue, I'll give you a little more flexibility there and say that we should be maybe within about 2,000. So the reason we think that's so important is every 1,000 ears per acre is worth five to seven bushel. So in this case here, if we're losing 6,000 ears per acre, you know, that's anywhere from, you know, 30 bushels on up into the 40, 45 bushel range. So it's a lot of bushels to give up. So if I had to grade this stand that we see here today, I, I would grade this stand pretty low. Uh, I would give this, uh, as far as an A, B, C, D type of a grade, I would get this down toward that D because I think 6,000 ears is just way too much to give up, too many dollars leaving on the table. In today's Ask an Agronomist, a viewer would like to know, with so many hybrids to choose from, how can I be sure I'm buying the traits that will have the best payback? It's a good question. As, as the traits are now being stacked on top of each other and you get multiple traits within a, within a variety, you have to be sure that you're buying a trait to fix a problem that you actually have. So, you know, it, do you have uh, an issue with corn borer? Do you have an issue with rootworm or, or cutworm or whatever the trait is that you're selecting? In a lot of cases, we may be paying extra for a trait, but we really don't experience a problem with that particular insect or that particular problem. That may be like buying hurricane insurance in central Illinois. While it's nice to have, but it doesn't happen very often. So if you're not dealing with um, 
some of the issues like a cutworm, for instance, because you're not leaving lots of residue, maybe you're not in a no-till environment or you're not in an area where western bean cutworm are part of your, your uh, bug picture, maybe that's a trait you don't need to purchase where uh, somebody else that would be very important to them. So look at that trait, say how important is that trait uh, to you and your operation and can you manage around that specific problem in a different way? Uh, maybe pest management and uh, implementing um, a spray pass or something like that for scouting. So no, I don't think we have to buy all those traits out there. I think we got to do it just like anything else. Decide, would it be uh, a big advantage in my operation to have protection against that certain thing, or is that something I really shouldn't be worried about and focus on something else? Next on Corn College TV, managing by longitude and latitude, GPS in the palm of your hand. And later, making sure your equipment is the right size for the farm. Ken Ferry breaks down the importance of getting work done in a timely fashion. When Corn College TV returns. Avail Phosphorus Fertilizer Enhancer is designed to increase your fertilizer efficiency and can boost your yield potential by 10 to 15 percent. How do we know? Well, first we tested Avail in a series of university trials that across different states, different counties, different fields and farms just like yours to prove that Avail will keep phosphorus available for the entire growing season. Avail has been proven around the world, and that's good news for your crop as well as your wallet. So visit chooseavail.com and see where Avail takes you. Rust is destroying your valuable equipment and property. Rust Guide permanently stops rust the easy way. No scraping, grinding, or sandblasting. Brush, spray, or roll Rust Guide onto any rusted metal and it will not rust again. Rust Guide is not a paint, but an industrial strength formula that kills rust on contact. It leaves a smooth finish that can be left as is or painted. Rust Guide protects from salt, manure, fertilizer, urine, and rain. Call 888 Rust Guide to talk to a rust expert. That's 888 Rust Guide or go to rustguide.com. Confusion, doubt, fear, forces that drive the markets in unpredictable ways. It would be nice to find a voice you trust, a broker with an impeccable compliance record, someone with global contacts and expertise, a sought after speaker who simply tells it like it is. All that with 30 years of experience navigating these markets. Someone like that would be quite a find. Bauer Trading, experience at work for you. I'm Greg Vincent, the editor of AgWeb, and welcome to our new site. This marks the end of many long months by a lot of us here at Farm Journal Media, and also even some of our loyal readers who were dedicated to helping us remain the homepage of agriculture. This new site is designed to have more vibrant content, easier navigation, and faster load times while still delivering the same quality information that you've come to expect from AgWeb over the past 10 years. So go ahead and take a look around the site and let us know what you think. AgWeb, the homepage of agriculture. Each week on Corn College TV, we share some tips on tools or activities that farmers can put in their toolbox. These are things that, when done properly, can help make the job easier and ensure producers get the most out of their fields. Today, we're going global. Global positioning, right here in the palm of your hand. You know, one of the things uh, we're always looking at is what are some of the tools a farmer can have in his tool bags. And one of the things that we found to be very helpful on the farm is a handheld GPS. So it's a very small unit with a GPS on it that we can actually get out into the field and do some things. We think this can be a big advantage in scouting programs. So if you're going out and you're doing some scouting, even early in the season, maybe we've got some areas in the field with a poor stand, we could mark that on our GPS. Uh, so when we go to look at yield maps later on this season, we can have some things to correlate back to that. We also feel that these can be helpful for when we get into situations like we see here where we have some nitrogen deficient corn. So we have a nitrogen deficient corn here. And if we went out and marked some of these out on our GPS, it would not only maybe help us for this year, if it was earlier in the season, we could still apply some nitrogen, or it's gonna help us to determine maybe fine tune our management zones for, for years uh, next year down the road. So coming out, doing some walking where these bad spots are, logging them on the points. Later on, when we look at our yield data, we're gonna have a lot more information to correlate things back with. 
So using these on the farm can also be helpful in any plot situation. So if you're laying out plots, we can still utilize these handheld GPS uh, to know maybe where some points are that we're logging different points. We can also use this with our soil sampling program. If you're pulling your own soil samples, we could go out and have our management zones on here, and then we're going to go out and pull cores within those management zones. Or if we choose to log points, we can also log points with this type of a unit as well. So this can really do a lot of different things for us, and we feel it's a good tool to have in your toolbox. Results with strong roots and strong stocks for performance you can take to the bin. Go with industry leading DeKalb Genetics and proven Genuity Trait Technology, letting you get more from every acre. Go all season strong. Go with DeKalb. Growing up in agriculture, I know how important information is to America's farmers and ranchers. They have the tremendous responsibility of feeding this great nation. Here at Ag Day, we're here to help with the latest in agriculture news, agribusiness with Al Pell, the big picture on weather with Mike Hoffman, and stories about the country way of life. Join me each morning for Ag Day, the country experience. Hi, Carrie Gottschall here with the perfect solution to your storage problem a stylish garage or shop right in your own backyard. U.S. Buildings offers you revolutionary designs that are strong, durable, easy to set up, attractive, and affordable. Why have a cluttered garage when you can have plenty of neatly organized workspace? U.S. Buildings put me in my new shop in no time. Their high quality steel structure is American made. It's even hurricane rated. Now, I can work on my antique cars right in my own backyard. Their innovative designs require no internal support, which means you get 100% usable space. I feel like my home is twice as large because I finally have all the storage space I need. Now all my keepsakes are here at home and not stored in a rental unit across town. No wonder thousands of Americans are using U.S. buildings. You should too. Call U.S. buildings right now. Our service representatives are waiting to answer your questions. Build it yourself and save. Ken, part of the systems approach is always being prepared with your equipment and machinery. Tell me a little bit about how farmers can size their equipment for their operation. Sizing or the efficiency of their operation plays a big, big role in staying on time with each event that they need to do. And it, it does come down to what's their manpower in that situation. We could have lots of machinery but not enough people to run it. So what's their manpower, their time window? And we talk about fall tillage, for instance. If you can have a tillage team following up the harvest, uh, you can be pretty efficient with smaller equipment. But if you're going to finish harvest first and you have to then do your tillage, your window gets pretty tight, and it's going to take bigger equipment, bigger horsepower. Same way with planting. We've got so many acres we can plant. And for a rule of thumb for our clients, we like to say, can I plant my corn in seven good running days? Now, it may take a month to get seven good running days. But if I get outside of that seven days, I may have to start thinking about uh, increasing the size of my planter or adding a planter to that scenario. Uh, some farmers got some sand and some guys got some clay so they can start in certain parts of their operation way earlier than others, and that gives them a little bit of uh, diversity within it too. But if we start stretching our planting window out to two and three weeks, it starts to get pretty risky to get that done. Ken, before farmers hit the field with the planter, they need to be sure they're sized right to make sure that seed bed's ready. Tell me a little bit how farmers can plan for that. That's a, that's a little bit of a tricky pass as well, meaning that they want to go as soon as they can to get the field ready so they can keep planting on time. But it is that first pass that puts in the most compaction if they do it too wet. So they want to be sized big enough that they can wait for the soil to be fit and then move when they need to and get the field conditioned and ready to go. But at the same time, they don't want to get too far ahead of the corn planter because if they're fitting that field for the planter and there's too much of a time lapse, then there can be a problem in there with the soil drying out and we could end up with a stand emergence. So the planter has to be synchronized with the seedbed preparation. They need to stay together as they're moving through the field and not let any uh, moisture get away that they would need to get the seed germinated. 
Thanks, Ken and Margie. Hey, that's a wrap. Corn College TV is coming to a close, but remember, you can always re-watch any of these episodes on our website. It's also a good way to share what you're learning with other people. Thanks for being with us, and we'll see you next time on Corn College TV. Class dismissed. Next time on Corn College TV, understanding seed genetics, Ken Ferry shows us the potentially dramatic difference between flex and fixed hybrids. From 30 inch rows to twin rows, planters can do it all. Next week, we're talking row spacing. And Missy tells us if you can't manage it, you can't measure it. We're keeping up with all of that new information with tips on record keeping. Next time on Corn College TV. Corn College TV is produced and distributed by Farm Journal Television.